Uh, okay, uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. The topic of our presentation is uh, the question as to whether Rosbardian economics, uh, that is the current of uh, the Austrian school, initiated uh, in uh, the United States by Mary Rosbard and uh, developed uh, by his successors, uh, such as uh, Walter Block, Hans uh, Hermann Hoppe, Jörg Guido Hülsmann, uh, to name uh, only a few. Uh, is value free, the verdict being negative. Uh, to it, uh, the main contention of ours is uh, that Rosbardian Austrian economics presupposes in its basic conceptual framework the libertarian theory of justice. However, uh, before we proceed further, uh, we should like to add a crucial caveat, namely, our thesis is not a critique. First off, our research uh, draws on the insights uh, by contemporary meta-ethicists, uh, such as Hilary Putnam or Philippa Foote, who set forth uh, plausible arguments to the effect that in human language, there are concepts, so-called thick terms, that uh, sort of transcend the famous fact-value dichotomy in that uh, they are both descriptive and prescriptive, or uh, evaluative, uh, if you like. Just uh, think uh, of concepts uh, such as rudeness, as opposed uh, to civility, or development, as uh, opposed uh, to stagnation, or retrogression, or courage, as opposed uh, to foolhardiness, or bravado, on the one hand, um, or cowardice, on the other, or murder, as uh, opposed uh, to, for instance, uh, killing uh, in self-defense. Those are uh, those terms that are dubbed thick terms that have double uh, descriptive and uh, evaluative meaning. Uh, thus, we should uh, also distinguish between two types of value-ledness in uh, social science. First, we have uh, ideological value-ledness, which is uh, about uh, all those things, all those bad things, you might uh, probably associate uh, with uh, value-ledness uh, in science. It is uh, about research, falsification, dogmatism, you know, dishonesty, scientific misconduct, and so on, and so on. Uh, the latter, in turn, the conceptual type of uh, value-ledness, that is, is about there being thick terms in uh, social sciences. And, at least uh, in our opinion, there is nothing wrong about it because such concepts shape the way we, as uh, human beings, see and describe things. Uh, just to give you a quick example, uh, try to describe the Holocaust uh, or Gulag uh, without uh, employing the thick term murder. Uh, also, it is uh, noteworthy that both Rothbard uh, and uh, his uh, successors, for example, Hoppe or Bloch, as philosophers, subscribe to metaethical cognitivism. That is, a stance according to which moral statements are not a matter of taste, but rather genuine and uh, truly fundamental knowledge. Thus, uh, at least uh, from their perspective, the presence of the ethical in economic science uh, should present no greater a difficulty than the presence of, uh, say, physics in uh, the fundamentals of uh, chemistry. Uh, finally, uh, Rosbardians and uh, other Austrians uh, as well have a good meta-scientific reason to abandon value freedom altogether, uh, value freedom or Wertfreiheit, uh, if you like. Namely, uh, as is known, Austrianism has uh, always been at odds with uh, the positivist uh, empiricist ideal of a unified science based uh, on naked observable data. One of the reasons for that has uh, always been the adherence uh, to the thesis about the dependence 
of uh, observable data upon theory, which is a claim shared by virtually all contemporary philosophers of science, by the way. Um, and now, who says that uh, in social sciences, the theory upon which uh, our observations hinge cannot be a normative one? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, take over from here for the time being. Uh, <clears throat> So maybe first uh, thing that I would uh, need here some additional explanation is whether our thesis that uh, Rothbardian Austrian economics is uh, value uh, laden or it's not value free is obvious or it's not obvious. Uh, we actually sort of struggled with this question because uh, in our experience it, it, it appeared to be obvious for some researchers and scholars and for some scholars it, it, it appeared to be controversial. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one of quotes that we decided to use here to show that Rothbard himself uh, subscribes, at least in some uh, uh, writings of his, uh, to this idea that Austrian economics, uh, in, in, well, in his version of Austrian economics, is uh, value, uh, value free. Uh, although maybe uh, one more word would be here in order, uh, it was sort of mentioned before by uh, Norbert already that, uh, of course, value freedom might be uh, understood differently. Uh, we can point into two ways of understanding this, uh, this uh, idea. Uh, one would be sort of uh, uh, street level understanding, I would say, which would be basically that uh, a, a piece of theory is uh, value laden or it's not value free when it recommends some uh, way of acting or you recommend some policy or that is uh, praising or blaming uh, uh, some sort of actions. The, in this sense, of course, it's obvious that Rothbardian Austrian economics is not value-laden, that it is value-free. But what we have in mind is actually more sophisticated uh, concept, more uh, philosophically advanced concept, which is that Rothbardian Austrian economics is value-laden in terms of its basic conceptual framework. Uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, which would be this uh, element of Rothbardian Austrian economics that would be value laden? Uh, well, we would we would suggest that uh, uh, one of uh, basic concepts that would uh, involve this uh, this sort of normativity would be uh, basically the concept of free market. Uh, when we mm, uh, when we th think about the free market, Rothbard understands free market as uh, as you can see here in this quote as an array of uh, all voluntary exchanges that take place in a society. Uh, but in turn, a voluntary exchange then uh, is uh, understood by Rothbard in terms of rights. Uh, rights that, of course, are uh, just rights or juridical rights, as we would say, uh, which are obviously normative concepts. Uh, now, in what way uh, uh, voluntary exchange, which is the basis for, uh, for free market and free market institutions for Rothbard, is uh, value, uh, value laden, how it is dependent on rights? So uh, I think that we can, we can find at least three way of th ways of three stages uh, at which we see this uh, dependence of the concept of voluntariness on uh, a normative idea of just or juridical rights. So first of all, for an exchange to take place, as, as, as noticed by Rothbard, of course, parties to the exchange have to have goods or services that they exchange with uh, one another, with, uh, with, with, with each other. But, uh, but for Rothbard, it's, it's pretty obvious not any old having would do. Uh, so there is a very specific having uh, that, that would figure in an exchange that Rothbard would then call voluntary exchange or free exchange. And this, um, uh, this uh, having, of course, has uh, um, everything to do with, uh, with the known theory of John Locke and, uh, and appropriation of unowned resources uh, via mixing labor. So as we can see here, uh, our selection, by the way, I, our selection of quotes uh, was on purpose uh, made from uh, Rothbard's economic treaties. So uh, b besides some exceptions, uh, we decided to go for these uh, quotes from Man, Economy and State, uh, which, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, at, at least, at least uh, declaratively uh, uh, or should be a purely economic treaties. Uh, so, so I think it shows even stronger how 
<coughs> the concept of a free exchange or voluntary exchange and free market and so on and so forth is uh, dependent on these normative, normative ideas. So, so first of all, as we can see, Rothbard, of course, presupposes Lockean idea of self-ownership as the starting point for the analysis of uh, which sort of having would do for free exchange to take place, and then it, uh, it switches uh, uh, into appropriating f uh, uh, unowned uh, resources. Now, maybe one point... Uh, more, as you can see here, uh, there might be, there might be uh, uh, a temptation to think that what Rothbard is really talking about is ownership in the economic sense. As, as we remember from Mises, Mises is using the word ownership uh, in, in this uh, value-neutral uh, or normatively neutral way, uh, economic ownership. Uh, from this quote, uh, amongst other quotes, we can uh, clearly see that this is not what Rothbard means, because if it really were economic ownership, that would be something that would uh, um, uh, resemble uh, possession or detention of an object or use of an object. Uh, that would basically extinguish at the moment at which this possession terminates. Uh, whereas for Rothbard, ownership uh, might, uh, mm, uh, might exist in perpetuity. Uh, so these rights are acquired uh, in perpetuity, as this quote uh, mm, uh, documents here. Then another thing... Uh, mm, that would be important here uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, that for Rothbard, what is the subject of exchange on the free market is not necessarily goods or uh, services, but titles thereto. Uh, these titles, of course, are titles that are acquired originally in the, in the ways I've just indicated, which is mixing labor and starting with the, uh, with the idea of uh, self-ownership. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, that's the second layer at which we would say that the idea of a voluntary exchange presupposes normative, uh, mm, uh, normative theory of, uh, uh, of justice, uh, libertarian justice. Uh, finally, probably the most important, the most interesting element is the manner of exchange. So even if parties have these titles that they acquired via mixing labor and, and, and via being self-owners, uh, not any manner of exchange would do for Rothbard, of course. Uh, there would be uh, exchanges that would be made under pressure. Uh, just maybe not to beg the question, there are different sorts of pressure uh, that might be exerted on parties to, to exchange, and only some of them would render these exchanges involuntary. So, of course... Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, manner of exchange, the, the manner of exchange that would uh, render the, the, this exchange involuntary uh, would be an exchange made under uh, uh, coercive proposals or under coercive pressure. Uh, this pressure uh, being, of course, uh, a threat directed towards property rights. So not any old threat would do. Uh, the very good case why that wouldn't be the case is, of course, blackmail, uh, which for Rothbard would involve uh, coercion uh, uh, in this normative sense. Uh, so uh, blackmail's proposal uh, would render exchange uh, voluntary. Uh, I guess uh, my time is yeah. down here. Uh, the same would be, would be with value, so we can just read that. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I know that uh, we are running short of time, so without uh, further ado, uh, let us uh, briefly apply our uh, analysis uh, to the case uh, study uh, of uh, three major areas of uh, Rosbardian research, uh, the comparative analysis of uh, economic systems, uh, theory of uh, monopoly, and uh, hopefully uh, welfare uh, economics. So, uh, as uh, for uh, the comparative uh, analysis, uh, as uh, you can see uh, in those uh, quotes uh, from Rothbard and uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, both uh, capitalism and the alternatives uh, to it, that is uh, interventionism and uh, socialism, are defined against uh, the Rosbardian moralized notions of voluntariness and freedom. The free market is free in Rothbard's uh, specific sense uh, of the term, and correspondingly, the alternatives are unfree in the very same sense. Now, uh, note that it is not the case that uh, what Rothbardians do is uh, simply juxtaposing the free market, as is uh, conceptualized uh, in uh, their moralized terms, uh, with uh, opposite uh, approaches uh, or, or systems. Rather, Rothbardians define those approaches or systems in their value-loaded terms as well. Uh, 
Therefore, the normative, uh, normative entanglement is uh, to be found throughout their comparative uh, analysis, the test in literally whatever they, ha they have to say, for that matter. Uh, secondly, uh, Rothbard's uh, seminal theory of uh, monopoly. Uh, even though, at first glance, the Rothbardian concept of uh, monopoly doesn't seem particularly suspicious, so to say, uh, value freedom-wise, the case raised by Rothbard uh, in its favor does. Uh, as is known, Rothbard, uh, for example, rejects uh, the idea of monopoly as uh, having control over the price. And along the same lines, uh, he also rejects uh, the idea of uh, consumer uh, sovereignty because uh, on the free market, says Rothbard, prices are voluntarily agreed upon phenomena voluntarily agreed upon phenomena, and each and every individual is a self-sovereign. And it so happens uh, that uh, we already know what uh, voluntary means to Rothbard. Uh, and now it uh, seems uh, pretty obvious uh, that per Rothbard, governmental monopolists are true monopolists since uh, they violate uh, the underlying property rights, uh, whereas uh, the alleged private ones do not. Uh, do we still have time to uh, talk about uh, welfare economics? No, go, ahead with go ahead, so we have one minute if you, we skip this uh, question. Uh, okay, but uh, I've uh, already finished this, uh, this part. So, uh, shortly about uh, welfare uh, economics. Uh, as is known, uh, Rothbard's uh, welfare economics uh, also hinges uh, upon Rothbard's uh, theory of uh, voluntariness, uh, Rothbard's uh, highly moralized or rights-based theory of uh, voluntariness. Uh, therefore, uh, long story short, uh, Rothbard's welfare economics cannot but be uh, uh, value-loaded as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Even I have a lot of questions by myself, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So uh, for anyone who has questions, please ask Łukasz or Norbert after the session. That I guess they will be eager to answer all of your doubts and questions.